Hey, hey, how you doing? You look great, man. Well, thank you. I'm above ground. <laughs> Where did you say you're in Huntington Beach? Huntington Beach. Huntington Beach. Oh, yeah, I know it well. I guess you used to hang out the Golden Bear back in the uh, in the 60s well, and 70s. I was, I've been there back in the day. But if I'm not mistaken, that's where Peter Tork was working as a bus boy or something. That's pretty when, cool. When uh, Stephen Stills told him about the monkey audition. That is incredible. Now, with the audition, you weren't, you were, you never read no ad I've, I've read. You just were hit by your agent to go to this audition. Am I correct? Yes, about that? yes of course, because I would already had my, my own television series, you see. Yes, you did. So when one has one's own series, one doesn't go to a cattle call. One has a <laughs> private audition with the producers. Well, you know what's interesting? I was thinking about this. I, I, we, we know a lot of the same contemporaries, but I think your career has spanned more than anyone's out there. I mean, you, you go back to a circus boy. So Well, I, actually, I, there's, there's some prenatal work coming out on ultrasound. <laughs> a little top hat and a cane. <laughs> um, no, that, uh, yeah. I actually did a screen test for a movie even before Circus Boy. I, like I was six or seven years old. Unbelievable. A screen test that I guess my dad's agent had, had set up. And um, for a movie, the movie was never made, but I have that screen test footage actually. That's that's amazing. You had a you've had a hit a milestone this past week with two albums uh hitting the charts. That's why we're talking today. Like <laughs> Christmas is here. I mean, you know, we go to your solo album, first time ever charted, and uh Mickey puts you to sleep. And uh it's about to show the fans that they didn't get it by now. Blue vinyl, lyrics, liner notes by Mickey, and of course, uh nineteen sixty six mono version of the monkeys, which yeah. handsomely put in your old picture sleeve is our inner sleeve. And That's very cool. You brought it to uh, Splash Vinyl. With this yeah, very movie. cool. But uh, we hit 15 on the Billboard sales chart for Puts You to Sleep for the Kids albums, which, again, and this album, the other one hit the Department Record Store charts at like 72 with a bullet. And I'm thinking, you know, these albums are they're resonating with a younger audience you know Joe, yeah i agree and i've kind of gotten used to it to be honest um <clears throat> and uh i talk about this all the time in my show and in interviews and things i um i put it down to well a number of things um and mainly it's the material uh in the in the music it was the songs and the songwriters it was the original material by the songwriters like Carol King and Jerry Goffin, Voice and Heart, Neil Diamond, Paul Williams, uh, uh, Neil Sadaka, um, you know, the list, Harry Nielsen, the list goes on and on. Well, these people don't write a lot of duff tunes. <laughs> so <laughs> that material stands up. And then in terms of the television show, the same thing. The producers, Bob Rafelson, Bert Schneider, director James Frawley, uh, the movie head written by Jack Nicholson, uh, directed by Bob Rape. But the material is where it starts and the material is what stands up. That's what people can listen to for years because the original source material is great. And <clears throat> I was blessed. I was blessed to have incredible writers writing for me. And I always, uh, as you probably know, I always give them credit. Somebody asked me the other day, uh, out of the blue, somebody said, you know, talking about um, new music and digital and and vinyl. And, and somebody asked me, why do you think the old music sounds better? And I... And I said, because the music was better. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but that is, yeah. you know, I, I don't care if it's digital, analog, carved in stone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, an old wire recording or, or you know, have, you know, 
quarter inch tape. It doesn't matter. The the, the material w was better. But uh, to be fair, there was a lot less material, and there was a lot less uh, outlets. There were many much fewer outlets. So by nature of, of, of the beast, the cream would rise to the top. There were only limited record companies, limited outlets, AM radio stations. Yeah. And what happened was, is that like the pyramid just gets smaller and smaller at the top. And so the cream tended to rise uh, to the top. And nowadays, of course, with so many outlets and so easy to produce now uh, music on your cell phone. Yeah, you you're know, right. And, and distribute it. It's, it's tough to find the good stuff. Uh, it, it, it's tough because there's just same with TV. So much of it. The TV guide used to be this little pamphlet about like this. Now it's a phone book. <laughs> well, you couldn't even put it in a in a phone book. You couldn't put it in 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 a, any kind of book if you look at your cable channels. Crazy. So that makes it tough. Gives a lot of people opportunity. That's true, but it does make it tougher to to find the stuff that you like and the stuff that's good too. Well, the fact that there's a young audience that's finding the monkeys and Mickey Dolan's and Michael Nesmith and Davy Jones and Peter Tork after decades. There's a whole new young audience as we discussed, but they're finding it. And we've been lucky with, with you and your brand and the monkeys brand for the last, I don't know how many years we've been doing these with Friday music and Rhino and yourself and, and the guys, but uh, we built quite a trust with the audience out there and they like what we're doing and the puts you to sleep. I think this vinyl, I think it was a big surprise and, how did, it, how did it come about? Uh, Harold Bronson, at the time, running Rhino, yeah, uh, decades ago, <laughs> uh, he came to me and he said they wanted to start a division of Rhino called Kid Rhino. And they wanted to compete with all the other uh, kid labels. There yeah. weren't many, the main one being Disney. And they wanted to 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 get on the shelves with, with uh, some CDs. And I was like, cool, that's great. Um, what do you have in mind? And he said, well, I thought an al about an album of lullabies was was one one thing. And I came up with the title, cool, how about Mickey Dolan's Put You to Sleep? <laughs> and very monkey kind of Yeah, thing. absolutely. And we picked the songs together. Oh, I didn't know one that. Really cool. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Harold and I mainly. Uh, picked the songs, got a few really good musicians involved, and went into a little studio. It was a very simple recording, you know, <clears throat> lullabies. Uh, and uh, some beautiful, again, material. There's three Beatle tunes. Yeah, no kidding. As you know. And a tune by my dearest friend, Harry Nielsen, remember, and Moonbeam song. And, you know, uh, it it just uh, it just fell together, you know, and it was one of those things that, you know, you just you give it your best shot, you do your best work, surround yourself by people who are hopefully you know doing their job and are talented, and then things just uh, just come together. But that's how that happened. Uh, he said, I want a couple of CDs for Kid Rhino. And uh, <clears throat> that was one. The other one was, as you as you know, uh, Broadway Mickey. Yep. Did Harry ever get to hear uh, his songs? No, I don't think so. Wow. It's hard to listen and remember without getting a little teary-eyed. It's uh, You do a definitive reading of that. And I would tell you, Blackbird is probably my favorite interpretation of any Beatles song. I just, you do a wonderful thing. I love the wind up at the end with the birds and all that stuff it's uh oh thank you i really think it's for yeah it's for kids but i think yeah us fans us die it's tough, and the boy, it's love it. to cover a beetle too <laughs> it's a cool album we've gotten uh you know fool in the hills wonderful with uh, i believe the guy's name was g on accordion uh yeah that was a nice touch that wasn't on the original beatles track 
but you guys really reimagined some things there. It's uh, pretty, uh, it's, it's really cool. Well, you know, if, if you're going to cover stuff, yep, you don't want to do a karaoke version. Right. And in, and in the case of uh, I'll Put You to Sleep, we had the opportunity to mainly simplify because it was for kids. And we, you didn't need an orchestra or an enormous electronic section of electronic guitars or whatever, because it's a lullaby album. It is supposed to put kids to sleep. So you <laughs> want to do it as gently <laughs> yeah. and kind of quietly and gently as you can. Well, so it's one of the reasons why we didn't pick Helter Skelter. <laughs> We'll save that for Bylam <laughs> too. <laughs> nightmares, uh, put you to nightmares with Mickey Dolans. Going back to uh, yeah, that's not bad. You yeah, know, maybe, you know, you do something like that. Uh, I'm in. I'm in. Hey, uh, sixty six, sixty five into sixty six. We're going back to the first album, the debut album. Um, questions you've heard a million times. I'm not going to try and ask this. I'm going to try and ask you some things you probably never heard before. What do you remember leading up to the earliest first recording session? That would be probably like June, maybe July of 66. And that stands out that you never really shared with your uh, with your monkeys fans. What stands out like the first? Well, the reason I <laughs> the reason I probably didn't share it is I don't remember. remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told I had a good time. <laughs> well, that's the book. We got to get into that. That's the name of my new book. We got to get and into funny that. Funny you should you should bring it up because. Uh, we just got the copies of the book, and one of the items that we found, I don't know why I kept it, uh, was a check, My one of my very earliest royalty checks. It was uh, for a session work on uh, on the monkeys, because we were yeah. members of the Musicians Union. So I guess it was a session check for something from the That's very pretty, early, early, early days. That is cool. For, $32.81 <laughs> for recording one of the monkey tunes. There and it go. was made out to George McDolphus <laughs> by from RCA Victor. There we go. Yeah. My and old I haunts. Kept it. I kept it and framed it. That's um, great. That's great. I don't, yeah. you know, Joe, I, it's because I don't remember. I mean, first of all, I mean, it was uh, 60 or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, 65 or well it'd been 66 and everything was happening so fast so much going on so quickly wasn't like this long slow ramp up no it was you know nothing. like over years and you know you rehearsed together and play and play together all of a sudden it was wham like that yeah because of the tv show obviously and all so much material need to be needed to be recorded quickly because they wanted two songs, new ones, for every episode when when the show first came out. What a great! Trailer. I would do. I would work in the, uh, on the set in the uh, the studio ten hours a day, wow. ten maybe more, and then quick dinner and go to RCA. To, rec to do maybe two lead vocals a night. That is so cool. That's amazing. And it was, and every night. So I didn't have a lot of downtime. And I just, I just don't remember uh, any specific, many specific moments. Did I do remember one, uh, one moment that I tell in my show. Um, and it's because, and it's on the first album, Clarksville. Yeah. Well, <laughs> You know, again, I don't necessarily remember that particular session, but I was talking to Bobby Hart a couple of years ago, and he said, I don't know if you remember, but you know the middle bit of the song that goes, right? Mm -hmm. I am a real famous book. There were words to that section Whoa. And that they'd written. A voice and heart. Uh, I he couldn't remember what they were. I don't remember, but they were something probably like going to the station and I'll meet you in the morning and I'm going to end up and it were yeah. words. And this was like probably midnight, 
Wow. After after working in the studio all day long, it's probably midnight, and I got to that part of the song. I said, Bobby, <laughs> I cannot, I can't do this. I got to be up in four hours <laughs> to get back on the set. I can't, can't learn learn this and, and do it. And he said, Tommy Boy said, yeah, screw it. Just go do 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 do. Perfect. It's a, it's a historical piece, man. It's a great story. Uh, I just remember, I mean, you did you know Davy Jones? Because you were both pretty much prominent actors in TV. At that, did you already know Davy at that point? Oh, no. You didn't no, even no. know him? No, no, none of us knew each other. We met, well, we, we must have met or bumped into each other during the screen tests and during the audition process. It went on and on for for uh, long. I seem to remember it felt like it was weeks, probably wasn't, <laughs> but much longer than your normal uh, uh, TV series audition. Um, I remember Davey from the auditions, from the screen tests, and I think that was because we had similar backgrounds in the business. He'd done television in England, yeah. And Broadway, I'd done television. And so we kind of had, we, we knew the process when they said hit, hit your mark yeah, or, you know, cheat to the camera or whatever. <clears throat> um, so we both knew that. And so I think we just probably kind of hit it off. So I vaguely remember Davey from the screen tests. But no, uh, the next thing I remember is my agent saying, you got the pilot. I went down for a wardrobe fitting, which is usually the first thing that happens. And that's um, in the middle of Columbia Studios. Wow. Uh, some producers said, uh, uh, Mickey, this is Davy Jones. Davy Jones, Michael Nesmith, Dude. Michael Nesmith, Peter Tork, Peter. Wow. Oh, yeah, I remember you. And that was it. You know, uh, you, you really think about it within a year. You guys had, I mean, I don't know how... I can't conceive of any other story in it, rock and roll, pop history, but for a year period there, you had four albums at number one. You had a bunch of number one singles. You had a number one television show. You're selling a concert. I mean, how would anyone remember all that? And how the hell did you find all that time to record all that music? Because I'm looking at the well, like sessions. I say, a lot was going on. I was, we, we were only 20, 21 years old. Jeez. You have a lot of energy 20 i was 20 uh, in 65 i was 20 and i think that was the year of the uh uh yeah yeah that would have been the year of the uh pilot season yeah. when i was up for the pilot and then 21 when you know when the show went on the air and stuff and um so you do have a lot of energy but also what happens joe is and i've talked about this in that kind of a situation you're you're you are accosted with so much input from all around you. You have, uh, in our case, the television show, the producers, the directors, the writers, then the recordings, the songwriting, the producers, the right, and then publicity, uh, interviews, photographs, photo sessions, <laughs> and then when you're on the road, it gets just ridiculous with fans and uh, live appearances and and at a certain point your brain just kind of shuts off it's like your computer saying wow. memory full yeah <laughs> cannot compute cash full memory you know in in your hard drive crashes yeah and in your brain it shuts off and it just can't take in anymore how could it i mean it's, you, and it's you an amazing amount of work today, and you see it today too and you see it a lot today, because on today, on top of all that, you got the social media mm -hmm. and the paparazzi, and you got, uh, you know, this incredible. You're you're like in in a a bubble. You're like in the eye of a hurricane, and the hurricane's going around, and you're in the eye, and your brain just shuts off, and you see it today, in, in like especially young per performers, big ones. That their their eyes take on a glassy kind of stare, mm -hmm. like a deer being caught in the headlights of a car, and they just kind of looking around, like, 
<laughs> you just can't take it in. That, that that's kind of what happens, I think. When you call, when you think about um, what would be the one ingredient? I mean, you guys didn't even know each other, which is I thought maybe one or two of you knew each other, but that's amazing. But when you think about how, what was the one thing, one ingredient that kept the four of you guys obviously making records and film a movie, TV specials, as well as a TV show and all that great music for three years for the first six original albums, including Head. What kept it together? Well, a number of things, not just one thing. Uh, first of all, you got to understand, and I, I know you know this, but oh, believe me, a lot of people don't. The Monkees was not a band. Yeah. It wasn't a group. It was a TV show about a group, this imaginary group that lived in a beach house in Malibu, which was a set. And the television show was about this group trying to be famous. And we never were famous on the television show. That's a very important uh, point. Um which does beg the question of how we could afford a Malibu beach yeah, yeah. It wasn't when we never got either. any work. But <laughs> there were the producers, Bob Rapelson, who created the show, Bert Schneider, producer. I mentioned the, the screenwriters. Yeah. So there wasn't just one thing. There, uh, there were a lot of things, but and a lot of elements, and a lot of people. The Monkees was not the four of us. It was like, uh, and John Lennon actually made this comment early on, they're like the Marx Brothers. And he was absolutely right. He meant it's like a compliment. He said he liked it. He was a good, he became a friend. Um, they got it. The Beatles uh, got it. Because, at, and I have a theory about this, England seemed to have got the monkeys more than, the, uh, than here in the States. And I think it might have been a tradition of that kind of sketch comedy shtick, um, improvisational, spontaneous stuff uh, before the monkeys, the goon show with yeah. Peter Sellers yeah. and, yeah. and yeah. the goodies and uh, Monty Python. It, it wasn't until the monkeys and after that the America started catching on to that kind of sketch comedy humor and, and shtick and, and stuff like that. So it was a combination of a lot of things, but it was definitely not just the four of us. But again, somebody, you know, I, I was, somebody cast me <clears throat> and I thanked the producers in the past for being cast in into the show. But because re remember, it was a cast of a TV show, but like <clears throat> the cast of a musical, a Broadway musical, uh, we could all do it. We could all sing and dance and act and, and do the stuff. <clears throat> uh, that was what was, I think, m so unique about the monkeys in that year. If you go back then, nothing like that was on television or ever had been. Um, and so that was kind of unique. One of the producers once said, when asked how, what happened, he said, we caught lightning in a bottle. Absolutely. You know, I think uh, being a little kid watching you guys during the Vietnam War and having a brother, it was two brothers are in the war. And uh, I think that speaks for millions of us that grew up. Well, you were our babysitters. You were the brothers we didn't have anymore. You were the brothers that were. I hear that a lot. You know, and uh, it's it's sad to say that, but, it, you know, that's the way TV was. You know, it was I Dream of Genie into the Monkeys. I mean, it was everybody's life there for you know, three years or whatever. And, Fantasy. Um, but it was definitely, it was a babysitter thing. And I think all these years later, you know, their kids, their grandchildren have, have caught on to this. And uh, you see it, you know, well, the, the reruns are incredible. You know? Well, they are. And they stand up again because of the writers and us and our, our, we were encouraged to improvise, which we did, which was unheard of in television wow. at the time. And encourage. We had training. We they brought in a, a coach to train us into improvisation, which was again, like I say, unheard of uh, in television at the time. And to their credit, they used a lot of it. And I think that was one of the elements the kids got and get to this day. 
Did you work with any uh, former camera guys and stuff from your circus boy days? You just was yeah. anything you set? Yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. funny you should say that because the show was done at the same studio on the same stages that I had done Circus Boy. Oh, that's cool. Um, and I remember when I drove up to the gate after I got the part of the monkeys, I drove up to the gate, you know, at the security gate at <laughs> Columbia Studios. And it was the same guard at the gate that had been there. Only It was only 10 years. Only 10 years before that I was doing Circus Boy. He said, hey, Mickey, I hear you got another show. Great. That's yeah. too cool, man. The cameraman, Lippy, a very famous cameraman, had been the camera operator on Circus Boy and then became yeah. a cameraman on the, on the monkeys. That is so Story. cool. Listen, Joe, I got to go. I want to thank you so so much for uh, all the wonderful, wonderful work and read issues of all this stuff. You know, it's fantastic. Every time I hear you're doing something, I'm like, yeah, that's great. And again, thank you for everything you've ever done for, for music. Uh, you have a million thank fans you, out there. And I'll see you in the new year at some gigs, okay? You will. Love you, brother. Thank Be you, well. buddy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.